We'll be reading in Psalm 34, verses 7 through 10. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Lord in prayer. Father, it is so good to be reminded, Father, that uh, we are nothing and you are everything. And Father, I pray that you would speak today and that you would speak through your word. But Father, I don't know that there is a more needed subject today than the fear of God. Father, I pray that you would put within us your fear. And Father, that you would put within us a desire for that fear. That your spirit would work that fear within us, Father, as you have done. Father, so many times throughout human history. Father, there is no word that I can say that would bring the fear of God. May your Holy Spirit, Father, work within us today. For I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As we've been looking here at Psalm 34, we have seen um, David's deliverance from, um, in all honesty, his own stupidity as he runs from Saul and he lies to um, Ahimelech and then goes to Achish and begins to act like a fool and how in these times he cried out and God delivered him. And we talked last week about the difference between legalism and grace as it relates to this, and we're going to kind of pick up on that as we continue through. In verses 7 through 10, as we look this morning, David is going to go over the blessed state of those who fear God. And this is something that we do not think about that often, as how blessed it is to fear God. But then in verses 11 and following, he is going to teach us how to fear God. So today we're not going to be spending much time in terms of how to fear God, as much as how blessed it is to fear God and what it actually means to fear God. In verse 7, David says this, The angel of Yahweh encamps round about them that fear him and delivers them. And he shows that for those who fear God, there is divine protection. The angel of Yahweh here um, could refer to the entirety of the angelic host. It is also very possible that this refers to the angel of Yahweh, which is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. You will see throughout the Old Testament there are many angels. There are Gabriel, and there's obviously the seraphim, and there's the cherubim, and all of those. But you will find that there is one angel that comes, and that is the angel of Yahweh, that is worshipped as God, that is called God, and is treated as God throughout the Old Testament. And this is Jesus Christ before he became flesh in the womb of the Virgin Mary. For us as believers, it really doesn't matter. Because we know that Jesus has promised to never leave us or forsake us. And as the children of God, Jesus Christ is with us, protecting us no matter what we may be going through. Now, he may choose to use his angels as he speaks concerning the little ones, that their angels always behold the face of their father, which is in heaven. But for us, it does not matter whether this is the angelic host or whether this is Jesus Christ himself. The point is that Jesus protects his own. Okay? And in this, when it says he encamps round about, the idea is pinching tents in a circle on every side. In, in Arabia, in that area, when they would have a prince that would be traveling, they would camp for the night, the, princess, the, the, the prince would throw his, his tent up and have it set in the middle, and then all of his attendants, all of his soldiers, all of his bodyguards would then pitch their tents in a circle around his tent. So to get to him, you had to go through all of his guards. But it was interesting, too, as they, as they pitched the tents in a circle, all of the doors were facing the prince's tent, not facing out. 
so that if anything was to happen and something was to happen to their prince, they immediately were looking towards him to direct him and to protect him. And that's the picture that David portrays here. That God is watching over his own. That Jesus Christ loves and protects his own children. That we are, as it were, surrounded by the heavenly host for divine protection as the children of God. You can see this very clearly in 2 Kings chapter 6. When Elisha, the enemy, remember, comes to the city that Elisha's in. They surround the city. You remember Elisha's servant becomes very worried. And what is Elisha's prayer? Lord, open the eyes of this man. And the man's eyes are open, and what does he see? He sees that the hills are filled with horses and chariots of fire, and that there are more on Elisha's side than there are of the host that has come to surround the city. You can see this in the New Testament in Acts chapter 12 when Peter's in prison. Okay, he is securely locked into a prison, many layers deep in the deepest cell, and what happens? God sends his angel and brings him out of the prison. You see, there's a tremendous protection here, but I want you to notice, though, that it's only for those who fear God. Now, this word fear, um, many modern Christians don't like because we don't want people to be scared of God. I've heard people say, I don't want my children to be scared of God. Well, they should be. The word fear here literally means to frighten. It means to make afraid. In fact, it means to terrify. That's what the word means. Fear is an accurate translation, but if anything, it does not contain near the level of fear that is contained in the Hebrew word. Now, he speaks of those who fear. Not only does the angel of Yahweh wa- surround them and protect them, but he says he delivers them. The word delivered is translated differently in some translations. Some would say strengthen, some would say arm. And the idea here is, again, those men in the tents coming out to defend the prince. They're taking their arms and coming to deliver the one who is in the center of the circle of tents. That's the picture here, that God himself fights for and protects his own. I was reading this past week, and I'm sure many of you were as well, as you read through the Bible. In Exodus, you remember when the, the, uh, the children of Israel are leaving and they're camped on the side of the, the Red Sea and all, all of a sudden Pharaoh and his army and his chariots come. And what is it that God tells Moses? You don't need to fight, you only need to be still. Why? Because God fights for his people. What a wonderful promise this is. What an encouragement this is. No matter what you are going through, and that is if you fear God, he is watching out for you. He has surrounded you with his, peop- with his angels, and he will deliver, arm, strengthen you. In verse 8, we see that those who fear God experience his goodness in this life. We are so um, rightfully um, angered, Um, put off, our stomachs are turned by the prosperity gospel, that sometimes we throw out the very promises of God. Yes, Jesus did not come to make you healthy and wealthy in this world. But the benefits of following Jesus Christ extend not just in eternity, but in this world as well. And we cannot neglect that. And that's what is seen here in verse 8. Because he, he says to all of these men who've gathered themselves in the cave there in Abdullam, he says, oh, taste. Now, the word taste here is not to take the whole thing. You know, whenever we have, you know, like dinner on the grounds or whatever, I always do what I call a sampler platter. And that is I go, and, and, and I, I learned it from my dad, you go and you take a spoonful of absolutely every single thing. So whatever lady who, who made food comes and says, hey, did you like it? You tasted her stuff. Every single one of them, okay? But then what you do after the sampler platter is the ones that you like, then you go back and you load up your plate with the really good stuff, okay? Um, it's all really good, but, but there's some that's just a little bit more to your liking than others, okay? And that's what he says is taste, taste, okay? Just, 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 just try it. Just try. Just try living a life of faith. And you know what? You will see. The word see there means you will perceive. You will find out. You will find out to be true. In other words, if you listen to David and you say, this life of fearing God and trusting God and following God, this life of, 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 of being a servant of Jesus Christ, 
sounds too good to be true. He says, you know what? Just try it. Just, just, just sample it. Just taste it. And you will find that God is good. Sometimes it's hard to see that. In the midst of the pain and the suffering that we go through in this life, Sometimes it's hard to see that God is good. I was watching an interview with a very famous scientist, and that was his argument as to why he did not believe there was a God, because there is pain and suffering in this world. And so either that means there is a God who is not all-powerful or there is not a God who is all-good. But we as believers know from Scripture that even pain and suffering in this life work together for good for God's people. And there are many, many negative things that every single one of us have walked through that we praise God for because of the goodness that he brought out of that pain. So he tells us of the experiential blessings that we have through fearing God. And notice in verse 8, he says, bless. The word bless literally in Hebrew means happy. And sometimes we go, you know, well, Christians aren't supposed to be happy. Maybe we should read the Bible. Following Jesus Christ leads to a happy life. It does not mean that there will not be sorrows. Jesus was a man of sorrows. It does not mean there will be grief. Jesus was acquainted with grief. It does not mean there will not be suffering. The Scripture is full of God's people suffering. But at the end of the day, we can count it all joy when we experience various trials and tribulations. And so he says, how happy is the one who trusts in him. Now, the word trust here means to flee uh, for protection or make refuge. It's the idea of running into a fort. And there's, there's two Hebrew words that are translated the same way. Um, but one of them, and that is the word that is used here, has implied within it the speed at which you run. So both of them are, hey, you run into the fortress and you close the doors and the walls protect you. That's the word trust here. This one is you run at breakneck speed you sprint, you run as fast as you can. And what a beautiful picture that is of trust, that no matter what is coming, if I can make it to the tower, I can weather the storm. And that's what faith is, is running to Jesus Christ. It is trusting Him. It is laying everything at His feet. It is trusting Him that no matter what may be coming against the walls of the fortress, if I'm in the fortress, I am safe. That's what the word trust here. And he speaks of how happy it is and how blessed it is to be one who trusts him. Not only does he speak of this experiential goodness, but he also speaks of divine provision in verses 9 and 10. He says, Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints. Notice the command there is fear Yahweh. Fear him, you his saints. For there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger. But they that seek Yahweh shall not want any good thing. The word want here is to be deficient, to be in need, to lack. And he speaks about how there is no lacking, there is no want, there is no need for those who fear the Lord. Now, we read that and we go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. And we're going to get to verse 10 and he's going to give us a further explanation. But this is the same thing that Paul tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, when he speaks about godliness. Is it not? Doesn't he say that godliness holds a promise for this present life and the life to come? That if we have Jesus Christ, we have all we need in this life. Doesn't David say the same thing in Psalm 37, 25, when he says, I've been young and now old, yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging bread? You see, what he says here is in keeping with the entirety of the rest of Scripture. But with this this no need of want is tied with the end of verse 10 when he says not want any good thing. Okay, God is a good God who gives good gifts to his children, but God is a good God who gives good gifts to his children also means he withholds bad things from his children. And sometimes we as children ask for things that would hurt us. And God in his love and his kindness and his grace and his goodness to us withholds those things because he cares for us. I love the way he speaks in verse 10 when he says the young lions do lack. I I found the Hebrew word here very interesting. The word young lion um, literally means village. 
And it's like, well, that's kind of a weird thing. But what it's talking about is a small little village where they would put up like a, a palisade wall. Where, you know, they cut down branches and cut down trees and they'd kind of stick them in a circle. And it's the idea of a very young male lion who's got a mangy mane. It's just coming in. It's just kind of sticking out everywhere. It's not full. It's not just the big majestic lion. It's the young lion. And that, that's where the word comes from. And it's interesting that he chooses young lions in this. Because when we begin to think about a creature who is self-dependent and independent, that should be feared by all, you don't get much more terrifying than a young male lion. You see, an older lion may not have the stamina. An older lion may get tired. An older lion may be injured. An older lion may have put on weight. An older lion may have a lot of the things that, that all of us find as we start getting older. But the young lion, okay, he's ferocious. He'll fight anything. He's got stamina. I mean, those of y'all with two-year-olds, you know what I'm talking about. They just go, 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 go. Okay? The young lion is going to be the one that never gives up on the hunt. The young lion is going to be the one that will fight anything. But you know what happens with young lions? Sometimes they go hungry. Sometimes the zebra gets away. It's not that often. Not as often, say, with an old lion. But sometimes even the strongest and the most ferocious with the greatest stamina and the ones that should be feared the most, their abilities fall short. And this is where he's teaching us to fear God Teaching, teaching us to seek God, teaching us to trust God. And he's contrasting it with this. I don't think there's anyone in here, and now some of you teenage boys have a lot of testosterone that's affected your logical capabilities. I don't think anyone in here would want to fight a young lion. Why? Because you know you would lose unless you're going to fight him with you know, a hand grenade or something like that. But you see, what he's showing here is the futility of trusting in yourself. If a young lion would destroy you, what makes you think that you can bring about what is necessary within your life? So many of us have tried and failed by the power of our own strength. Some parents try this, and I, I've seen this with parents and it reminds me of the, the passage where it says, the wrath of man does not bring about the righteousness of God. You can show all the displeasure and all the power of your will, and it will not change your children's hearts or behavior. It's the truth. You can try all you want, and you can put forth all of the effort that you want, but at the end of the day, there are things beyond your powers and abilities. I, I think of this in just our, our current economy. It doesn't matter how intelligent or strong you are. If you're in the wrong country and inflation spikes and the economy stinks, it doesn't matter. All of your efforts and abilities and intelligence and willpower, you know what? At the end of the day, there's an end to those things. But there is no end to God's power. And God takes care of those who seek Him. Now, the word seek here is a very interesting word because it means literally to tread or to frequently tread. It's the idea of following a beaten path. It literally can be translated to follow. It, it can also be translated to worship. And so it's the idea of, of seeking or following someone so closely because of the value you place on them. I, I, what, as I was thinking of this, I was thinking just of my own life. Um, um, when I was younger, I was obsessed with basketball, absolutely obsessed with basketball. And if you pay attention to young men, um, you can tell pretty quickly, um, if you know anything about sports, who is the athlete that they emulate the most. Because you'll begin to see the way that they begin to play the sport, the way they begin to dress, all of those type of things because they want to emulate them. I, I remember I really loved Vince Carter. 
and I was watching something on Vince Carter, and I learned that he learned how to shoot with his left hand. He could shoot three-pointers with his left hand as good as his right hand. So guess what I spent the whole next month doing? Shooting with my left hand. Because that was, that was the obsession. And that's the point here, is that you, you value God so much that you want to walk where your footstep falls, where his footstep went. And you want to be as close as you possibly can, that you are treading after him. You are beating the path right behind him. You are following him because you worship him. You value him. You want to be like him. If you look here, you see this divine protection. You see this divine provision. You see this provision is something that we experience here in this life. But unfortunately, so often we misinterpret these verses. Because it's so easy in our pride to say all of these verses apply to me. But they don't. They only apply to the one who fears God. And unfortunately, we don't even know what that means anymore. What does it mean to fear God? So I want to spend time in terms of application really focusing on the fear of God. Because yes, we're going to learn how to fear God in verse 11. And we've seen all the blessings that come to those who fear God. But what does it mean to fear God? I want to begin by going back to Genesis 25. This has been probably the most profound passage of Scripture for me personally as it relates to fearing God. And that is the story of Isaac. Genesis 25, and we're going to begin in verse 20 of Genesis 25. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as his wife, the daughter of Bethuel the Syrian of Paddan Aram, the sister to Laban the Syrian. Isaac entreated Yahweh for his wife because she was barren. Yahweh, Yahweh was entreated of him, and Rebekah his wife conceived. And the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is so, why am I this way? And she went to inquire of Yahweh. Yahweh said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two manner of people shall be separated from your bowels. The one people shall be stronger than the other. And notice this. The elder shall serve the younger. Now, we all know what happens, okay? The older brother is Esau, and the younger brother is Jacob. And Jacob means trickster. And we're going to see for the next 40 years of Jacob's life that that's exactly what he is. He is a conniving, deceiving trickster. And what we see throughout this life is that, that Isaac begins to have a natural affinity with the oldest son, Esau. He loves Esau. He's close to Esau. And they do what parents should never do, and that is that they begin to play favorites. Y'all remember where, where Isaac's favorites Esau, but Rebekah's favorites Jacob. But throughout it, we see Jacob playing tricks to steal the birthright and all those type of things. But there's one thing that has been withheld, and that is the blessing. Now, we, we in our culture don't understand the, the blessing that was being mentioned here. But this blessing is that you would be the head of the tribe of the family. And that as, coming from Abraham, that the Messiah would come through your descendants. Okay, It is to be the one who rules over the family, to be the patriarch, so to speak, but also to receive the promise of the Messiah. Isaac has known since before Jacob and Esau were born what God's will was. God's will was that Jacob receive the blessing and be the one who rules over his brother. But what happens? You see, we always get so focused on Jacob's tricking that we do not see the rebellion of Isaac. You see, we are so focused on, on how Jacob tries to trick his father and how, how even his mother gets involved in that tricking. But have you ever realized the pains that Isaac went through with his dim eyes to make sure that it was Esau he was blessing. 
he knew full well what he was doing. And that is Esau was going to get the blessing. And when you look, as he comes to place the blessing on him, in Genesis 27, I want you to notice the willful rebellion of Isaac against God. He's here. And he's done everything he can. Genesis 27, verse 29 to ensure that his hands are laid on Esau and that he is defiantly exerting his will to make Esau the ruling son. And this is what he says. Let people serve you, nations bow down to you, be Lord over your brother. Let your mother's sons bow down to you. You don't get any more willful rebellion against God than what we see in Isaac's life. But then Esau comes in, and we just focus on Esau's anger. That's what we get focused on. But I want you to read it, and it's amazing in Hebrew. I want you to look at verse 33. Okay, In verse 32, Esau comes in, and, and, and Isaac says, Who are you? He says, I'm Esau. I want you to notice in verse 33, it says, Isaac trembled very exceedingly. Okay? It's almost impossible to translate in English what actually happens. The literal Hebrew is that Isaac trembled with a great trembling greatly. Okay? In other words, that man was shook to his core. Completely, totally shaken like you could never shake anybody. Physically trembling. Because what he realized is that even in his self-will, God still had his way over his life. And there was nothing he could do to stop God. No matter how much he bent his will, God's will would be done. Now this has a profound, profound impact on Jacob. How many of y'all are familiar with the phrase, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? How many of y'all know that's not the phrase that Jacob uses the rest of his life? He'll swear by the God of Abraham and the fear of my father Isaac. Go look it up. That's the way he refers to God. Because in this moment, Isaac becomes terrified of God. By the way, you think this had some influence on Jacob later on when Joseph comes to have his sons blessed? And you remember, Jacob, I'm not making the mistake my dad did, and he crosses his arms. I'm not doing that. I'm not going to go against God. I've seen what happened to my dad. That's the fear of God. Now, what does that look like in David's life? Well, it's interesting. We can read. We can read. We know what's going on with David right here before Psalm 34. We know about his lie. We know about him acting foolish. But what we do not find in Psalm 34, we do not find any excuses for his sin. Why? Because when you stand before God, excuses don't matter anymore. There is men who were with him, who went along with his lie, who went along with him acting crazy. But he doesn't turn and say, well, all these people did it too. Because that doesn't fly with God. You see, when you have the fear of God, you become concerned with what I have done and I answer to God and I stand before God and it doesn't matter what anybody else saw. It doesn't matter what anybody else heard. It doesn't matter what anybody else did. It doesn't matter whether people were worse than me. It doesn't matter where people were better than me. I answer to God for me. No excuses. None. Okay? There's no excuses, but I want to go even further 
Because when, when we talk about fearing God, there is no excuses made for sin. But let's go a step further in fearing God. There is no concealment of sin. Okay? If you go through and you read commentaries, they view Psalm 32, which is a psalm on confession of sin, Psalm 33 and Psalm 34 as being combined. Okay? That there is in the Christian life no secrecy. There is no hiding. Everything is laid out and open. Why? Because there's going to come a day when the secrets of all men's hearts will be revealed. Everything you have ever said, everything you have ever done, everyone will know at that day of judgment. So there is no trying to hide. There is no trying to conceal. This is one of the most amazing things about the Word of God. David allows his lie, his craziness, his adultery, his fears, everything that he does, he allows to be on full display thousands of years later. You find the same thing with Peter, his denial of Christ, James and John. They're, they're, they're wanting to call down fire from heaven on the Samaritans. Every one of their unbeliefs, every one of their mistakes, it's all open. It's all laid out for all to see. There is no concealing. Everyone will know, so we don't care if everyone does know. That's David's mentality. Because you see, if you fear God, you are far more concerned with what God knows than what anybody else knows. And that's why there is a confession of sin. A confession means to bring to light, to, to name it, to own it, to lay it out. But you see, and this is what's so closely tied in here, is that there is no fear of man in David. David feared Saul. That's why he lied. David feared Achish. That's why he acted crazy. I love the quote that's in the bulletin that Kathy put. When men no longer fear God, they transgress His laws without hesitation. The fear of consequences is no deterrent when the fear of God is gone. You see, when you do not fear God, it's because you fear man. Now, this fear of man is a very interesting, tricky thing, like all sins are. Because some of the people who feared men the most, according to Scripture, were the Pharisees. But if you think about it, because the Scripture tells us that, they love the praise of men rather than the praise of God. But here's the interesting thing. The Pharisees lived their whole lives trying to convince everyone that they didn't care what anyone thought. It's interesting, because many times the man who says the loudest, I don't care what people think, is the one who fears men the most. You know why? Because they're trying to create a persona and they are more worried about that persona being shattered than they are reality. And what you see is that in the Pharisees, and this is why the Pharisees resorted to all of the meetings with Jesus behind closed doors, at night, in the darkness. This is why they arranged with witnesses. That's why they did all of these things. Because they wanted to conceal because they were scared, the Scripture tells us they feared the people. They were scared what would happen if people knew. I love William Gurnall. William Gurnall says this, We fear men so much because we fear God so little. But then he gives the cure. One fear cures another. To fear God is to be far more concerned with what you have done against Him than any of the consequences, than what anyone may think of you or know of you. Tim Keller ties us back to legalism because it says legalistic remorse says I broke God ru God's rules. Real repentance says I broke God's heart. 
You see, when we talk about legalism, legalism still tries to give a portrayal in front of the world. And so we must do whatever we can to conceal the truth from a watching world. But when it comes to grace, that my standing before God is based upon what Jesus has done, then it does not matter who knows what I have done. There is nothing left to conceal. And so this really begins to ask the question of me, but of you. Do you fear God? Are you terrified of people knowing the truth? Are you scared of people knowing what you have said and done? Are your children in fear of saying what they have seen in your home? Is your wife scared to say what she has seen you do? Is your husband scared that people will find out the way you have been acting? You see, so often we are far more concerned with the appearance before man than our standing before God. And what we are called on to do in this passage is see the blessedness of no longer caring what men think, of fearing God and God alone, of pursuing Him. As, as I was reading this, I just was reminded of the, the, the song, though none go with me, still I will follow. I'm going to pursue Christ even if no one else goes with me. That should be the mentality. This is the trust. This is, even if people say, don't run into the tower, I'm going to flee to the tower. That's, that's the trust. And so I want to really ask you first and foremost, is the fear of God evident in your life? Do people look and say, there's someone who fears God? If you do not fear God, would you turn from your sin and you run to Jesus Christ? We're going to look at how to fear God. David's going to teach us the fear of God. But would you turn from the fear of man? Listen, some, some people don't come to faith in Christ because they're scared of what their friends will think. Listen, I guarantee you, one, if you're younger, they won't even be your friends in five years. If you're older, they probably won't even be your friends in five years. But two, when you stand before God, it doesn't really matter their opinion. If the whole world hates you and God says, well done, then who cares? And if the whole world loves you and Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you, their opinion doesn't matter. Would you fear God today? Would you turn to Jesus Christ? Would you seek him? Would you pursue him? Would you repent of the fear of man? Would you be someone who confesses your sin, openly acknowledges that which you've said and done without excuse, without concealment, to lay it out? What will people think? Who cares? What does God already know? That is what matters. May we experience the blessings of fearing God. Amen.